Today we're going to learn Chagiga Daf Yud. This is the Daf for Shabbat. Today's Daf is sponsored by Rina Strauss. And gratitude to Rabbi Nit Michelle for enhancing my learning and in honor of completing the Sechem Moed Katan. Okay, we're now going to start with um, the, the top line number three on our page. We finished with this topic of someone who leaves learning Torah. So now we're going to see leaving learning Torah is not just leaving to learn, uh, leaving to stop learning Torah in general, but what is this pasuk leyotzeva laba en shalom? The one who goes out and comes in is does not have peace. Okay, doesn't have. Let's see exactly how they define doesn't have peace. Okay, this is a pasuk in. Uh, actually, where is this pasuk? Okay, in Zacharia. Okay. Ze amarav kevan shiotze adam midvar halacha lidvar mikha shuv en lo shalom. Okay, this is if, if I could think of a better um, marketing for Dafyomi, and I'd say this is a joke, I don't mean this, but, um, and what the, maybe I should even say it is a joke, but it sounds like, you know, don't leave Dafyomi and go learn 929 because what happens, right? This is someone who leaves Dvar Halacha, you're leaving learning the Halacha, which is in those days, right? It was their Gemara, basically, the explanations of all the Halacha, and you go to learn Toha. Okay, now, clearly, it's a good thing to learn Torah. I was kind of joking about the 929. Um, if somebody leaves Dafyomi, obviously, if you're listening to this, you're still in Dafyomi. But if you do decide to leave Dafyomi to go to 929, that's great. Um, if you do both, even better. But what this is saying is, if you leave learning Halacha and you go and just learn Torah, what's the problem? You're not going to know, you're not going to understand Halacha. Because learning Halacha gives you an understanding of Halacha. And with, again, what they mean here is not just bottom line Halacha. What they're saying is learning the Gemara and the reasons and all of that. That's really important. So this is really the best and if people say, why should women be learning Gemara? This is your answer. Because in order to do halacha, right, you can't just by learning Tanakh. It's not sufficient. It's really not. So, I mean, it has been. People have done it. But it's it's not great, right? You, you have a much better understanding when you understand everything behind it. So then, shuvein lo shalom, right? So if you leave halacha and you go learn Tanakh or Torah, you don't have shalom. Amal, if you think that wasn't enough, he says, that poresh mi talmud mishnah. If you stop learning Gemara and you go to Mishnah, that in and of itself is problematic because, again, Mishnah doesn't have all the details. It doesn't have the background. It doesn't have the connection to the, to the Pesukim, right? The, the Torah, the Talmud, sorry, gives you a whole perspective of everything and a much better understanding. For Rabbi Yochanan, this is going to be the most surprising. I feel me shas the shas. Now, what is shas the shas? Right? Even from Gemara to Gemara, what he's saying, according to Rashi, is if you leave the Yerushalmi and you go to the Bavli, and there's a Gemara that talks about Shivani, I put you in darkness, and that Bavel was the place of darkness, and they didn't really have good Torah there. And he's been, you have to remember, he was in the beginning of the, of the time period of the Amoraim, not like at the end, right? By now, by the time the Gemara is finished, the Bavli is much more organized and better. But what he's saying is, don't leave the Torah to Israel and go learn in Babylonia. That's bad, okay? He was trying to strengthen his own Beit Midrash, probably, and also he believed that it was, you know, there was better Torah in Israel, which at his time it might have been. Again, Rav establishes this big Merkaz in Bavel, this big center, but still it was, you know, the beginning. New Mishnah. Heter nidarim, very famous mission. Heter nidarim porchim ba'avir ve'en lehem amash yismoku. The fact that we can undo vows at our will, meaning I can go, I make a vow, and then I go to a chacham, a rabbi, and I was three people, a beitin, and I say, listen, I really, I regret that I made this. I really didn't, I didn't realize that if I took this vow, this was going to happen, or I was going to get into this situation, and I wouldn't want to be with the vow. So they can undo it. He says, that concept is way up in the air, there's no place for it to rest upon, meaning there's nothing in the Torah that indicates this whatsoever. It's just some other halacha that the rabbis came up with that has no basis in the Torah whatsoever. As opposed to, it's going to give three categories in this Mishnah, Hilchot Shabbat, Chagigot Bimilo. Now we know why this is here, because of Chagiga. Hilchot Shabbat, the laws of Chagiga and the laws of Me'ilo, which we'll explain in a little bit. They're like mountains that are hanging on a hair. Okay, which we know is not very much, but at least it's hanging on a hair. Shehen mikamuat v'alachot merubot is a little bit in the Torah. It's like hanging from the Torah. Let's say the Torah is up above. There's a hair, and then there's a mountain hanging on that Torah, on that, <coughs> I'm sorry, right, hanging on the Torah by a very small hair. Because they're mikramuat, there's very little pesukim, but halachot merubot, many, many halachot. We're going to have to see what exactly they're referring to. Third category. Hadinim, 
monetary laws, avodot, sacrifices, taharot vitzmeot, right? The vitzmeot, right? Everything that's what's pure, what's impure, laws of purity and impurity, arayot, forbidden relationships. Yesh lahanamashi smocho lehen hengufei tukha. These have what to rely on, and these are the main things that are mentioned that are written in the Torah. So now, and maybe this is why the previous Gemara talked about why it's important to learn the Gemara, because the Gemara has all these things that barely have basis in the Torah. So now the Gemara starts off with a bright head that basically disagrees with this mission. Okay, certainly about the heter, we're going to start with the heter nadali. Basically, what we're going to show is four Tanitic opinions in the Brayta, and then one Emora, Shmuel, is going to, are each going to basically give a source in the Torah for the concept of Hatarat and Darim. Then the Gemara is going to, Rav is going to say, only Shmuel's, there's no question on, all the other four I can knock out, and he does, and then we're left with Shmuel. This is a similar structure. We had a Sugya Megillah that was like this, where there were all these Tanaim, then came Shmuel with a much better answer, all the others got knocked out, and Shmuel were left with, and we end with a cute little quip about what what this whole scenario uh, is. We'll get to that at the end, the end of this section. So Tanya, Rabbi Leazar Omen. So the Brightest says, Rabbi Leazar says, Yesh lana mash yismoko, heter nitarim, of course they have what to rely on. Shnei amal, ki afli, ki afli shte pa'amim. The word ki afli means, you, and when someone expresses something in words, one is in erchin, to give the value of someone to the temple, and the other is in nazir, to basically take upon a vow of to be a, a nazirite, um, to be a nazir. So both of them give these, there's the same language appears by both. What do we learn from there? Shtei pa'amim, why does it say it twice in the Torah, this language, same exact language? It means you can, a vow is just something you expressed in words. So you can express in words to forbid it. And then you can express in words that I feel bad about it and I want to get rid of it. And then someone can undo what you did. So there you have it. Rabbi Yeshua, me'el yesh ha'mamash yismochu, sh'neemal, asher nishpati ba'api. Okay, this is imi vo'un amunur chati. It's a pasuk from Tehilim. We say it in our davening. Asher nishpati ba'api, God says, I swore in anger. And when you swear in anger, usually you want to undo what you did because you were angry about it. In that case, God happens not to undo it and he punishes us. But in any case, we'll get back to that. That's going to be part of the rejection of this one. But right now they're saying, sometimes you say, often people make a vow out of anger. And then they, re- they regret it later when they're not angry anymore. Rabbi Yitzchak, Amar Yesham Amash Yismochu Shneemal, Kol Nediv Libo. This is in Shmo, chapter 35, where it says, everyone, I think it's 35, Everyone who, um, just looking for the verse, yeah, 35. We're going to, this is everyone who wanted to brought things to the temple, right? They brought different objects to the temple to build the, uh, the tabernacle, to build the tabernacle. So now it says, why call the deeply bow? He says, what do you see here? Only people who wanted to in their hearts. So if I kind of decided and then I changed my mind, I wouldn't have to bring it. Only people who really want to, right? How many times it happens sometimes you think you want to do something and then you change your mind about it. So we, clearly, only the people who brought were the people who really wanted to do it, and the people who changed their mind were able to get out of it. This is also from Tehilim. It says, I will swear, and I will do what I swore to do in order to keep your mitzvah. So here you see, you swear, and I will fulfill it. That seems to indicate one could swear and not fulfill, because here it's saying, I swore and fulfilled, which maybe is not everybody needs to do that. So that's his proof. Amr Rav Yudam or Shmuel, those were the four Tanaim. Now Rav Yehuda comes in the name of Shmuel. If I were there, I would have said, my answer is better than all of yours. First of all, his pasuk is better because it's right there in the section of Nidarim and vows. All the others were not. Here it says, when you, t- when you take a vow, you can't desecrate your word, meaning you have to keep what you said. So now what does it mean there? Who I know mochel means you can't desecrate your own word, but someone else can. They can change his words. They can say, oh, we can undo. So there you see, only he does, not any, but anyone else, only he has to keep his word, but other people can undo his word. Those are the chachamim who can do hatarat nedarim. They can undo your vow. So Amara, the kulu ilu pircha, I told you Rav was going to say this, all of the other ones I can knock out, levarmi de shmuel, other than shmuel, delele pircha, that I have nothing to say against if you want to learn from Kiafli, you know what? That pasuk is used for something else. When it says Kiafli by Nizirut, it's to teach you a different halacha. If I'm walking on the street and I see someone who's a Nazir and I say, I'm going to be like him or her, that, that's Nazir. Okay, this is called Hatpasa. We'll learn all about this when we get in Seder Nashim. There's Mesechet Nidarim and Mesechet Nazir. 
We're going to learn all about these things. Do it with a vow. You could do it with a, uh, a, a Nazir vow. Nazir vow is just basically another type of vow. So now they say, Rabbi Yehuda said the name of Rabbi Tarfan, Detanya, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Shum, Rabbi Tarfan, the Olam, ain't echad mehem nazil. In a particular case, I'll explain in a minute. Neither becomes a nazir. Shalom nitna nizirut elala hafla. Because it says by nizirut ki afli, when you express with words, it means you have to have a complete expression that only can be understood in one way or, or the result will only be one thing. So what's the case here? If someone's walking by and I think they're a nazir and you don't think they're a nazir, and I say, I'll make you a bet. Okay, if they're a Nazir, I'll be a Nazir because I'm so sure they're a Nazir. And you say, if they're a Nazir, if they're not a Nazir, I'm going to be a Nazir because I'm so sure they're not a Nazir. And then we find out whether they were a Nazir or not. Neither of us become a Nazir. Why? Because you can only take upon Nazirut when you're 100% sure that you want to be a Nazir. That we learn out from Kiafli. That's the halach of Rabbi Tarfon, the Rabbi Yehuda passes in the name of Rabbi Tarfon. So therefore, I can knock his out because the kiafli is needed for that rasha and not for Xerah Shava to the other place. Or not Xerah Shava, but uh, sorry. Not uh, that, oh, it's mentioned here and it's mentioned there. That gives us two mentions. That means one is least or one is Leheter. Next. Imi de Rabbi Yoshua, who said, right, what it was his explanation? Asher nishpati be'api. So I already told you, Dilma hachi kamar. Ba'api nishpati velo hadranabi. I did it out of anger, but I'm not changing my mind about it. I already swore, but I swore it's going to be true. Which means you can't undo your vows. Now, what did he say? Maybe Nidivlibo is there in the verse to say, is to come and teach you against the halach of Shmuel. We need this word for what? Just because I think, let's say I want to give stuck, okay? I want to give something to the temple. What do I do? I basically say, um, I just think it in my heart. If I just think it in my heart, I don't have to do it according to Shmuel. I actually have to express it in words for it to have validity or for it to be something significant that I have to keep to. But maybe Nadiv Libo comes to teach you, even if you just thought it in your heart, you then needed to bring it. And then that would be the opposite. of Rabbi Yitzchak who tried to say Nadiv Libo is people who only wanted to. Here we're saying, if you wanted to at some point, you're going to have to do it, even if you never expressed it in words. Which was the last one, which is Nishpati Vakayemna, Ishmor Mishpati Kecha. I swore and I will fulfill to do your mitzvot, right? The things you commanded me. So maybe, maybe that's needed for Rav Gidal Amarav. How do we know that you swear? You have to swear to keep a mitzvah. You can make, you can swear to do a mitzvah, even though you're already commanded, you can swear about doing a mitzvah. And that we learned from this pasuk. There's a whole debate about it. What about Moshe of Omei Mehar Sinai? We'll talk about that more in depth another time when we get to laws of swearing. But what do we say? There's nothing to argue against. Seems like a pretty good proof. Either Rava himself, who already brought to very Shmuel and said, basically, Shmuel is the, the only one, right? He's the one who brought all the difficulties. Or maybe it was someone else from Nachar Yitzchak said, this is what people say, one little sharp pepper is better than than a whole bowl full of gourds, okay? One sharp emora is better than all the big Tanaim who generally are stronger and better. But here we have one very sharp, small, Pill pill, and he right a little pepper, and he's stronger than the others. Okay, next Hilchot Shabbat. We're now going to the second part of the Mishnah. We're going to basically go through today the next three sections. We won't finish with Meila yet, but we're going to start with it. How do we know Hilchot Shabbat, Chagiga, and Meila are Hararim Hatulim Basara? There's a little bit about them, but not enough, right? So what's this thing that we're learning from the rabbis? It's somewhat connected to a verse, but not really. So Hilchot Shabbat, what do you mean? There's a lot written about Shabbat in the Torah. It must be for Rabbi Abba. If you dig a ditch on Shabbat, which you're not allowed to do because of Choresh, that's what you do when you plow. But, right, which is one of the Malacha. But if you really don't need the ditch, you only need the dirt, and then you end up with a big ditch in your garden, which you don't even really want. So, Paturale, you're exempt. That is not written in the Torah and is only very loosely connected to the Torah. 
So the Gemara says, Kiman, according to is this, Kerab Shimon, Tamar, Malacha Shen Tsrikhalagufa, Patora Le. This is a classic case of Malacha Shen Tsrikhalagufa. You're doing the Malacha, but not for the purpose of what the Malacha was meant to be done. It wasn't, you're not doing it to plow, you're doing it for some other reason. So according to Rabbi Shimon, you're exempt. So it must be according to him, because according to Rabbi, Yocha, Rabbi Yehuda, who disagrees, who says, Malacha Shen Tsrikhalagufa, you're obligated. Well, then that's not any Chiddush, it's just you're, you're digging, so it's forbidden. But then the Gemara says, no, even Rabbi Yehuda will exempt in this case, because when he said, that's in a case where you're doing something productive. Here you're doing something destructive. You're destroying your field. You're digging a ditch, right, in order to get the dirt, but you don't really want the ditch in your garden. That's destroying your garden. So then even Rabbi Yehuda will exempt. So basically the Gemara concludes that even according to Rabbi Yehuda, this is a big chiddush, right? It's a new halacha. It's not really mentioned in the Torah. So my harim atzluyim b'sara, so going to Amubet now. So what is this harim atzluyim b'sara? Where does this come from? And why is it not really written in the Torah though? Melechet machshevet asra Torah, or melechet machshevet lo k'tiva. This is all based on this concept, which we learned a lot in Masechet Shabbat. The melechet machshevet asra Torah, the Torah forbids something that's a creative action, learned out from the Mishkan. And in the Mishkan, it says, but it never says it in the building of the tabernacle, but it never says it by Shabbat. So therefore they say, this is something that it has to be a creative action, not something destructive, not something that's done for a different purpose than the Malacha was intended for originally. And therefore it's going to fall into this category. Chagigo. What about Chagigo? Same thing. What do you mean? It says in the Torah. It says in the Torah where in Vayikra you get uh, Kafkimo, Prashat Emor, when it talks about the holidays, it says, Vachagotamoto Chag Lashem, Shibak Yamim. Okay, you have to celebrate it for seven days. Chag, what is Chag if not Korbanot Chagiga? So, Lotzrich Vachadamar Leor of Papala, Baye, Mimayda Hai Vachagotamoto Chag Lashem Zbicha. Who's to say Chagotem is sacrifices? Maybe. Dilma, Chugu Chag Achamarafmana. Maybe it means go have a celebration, eat some meat, but not necessarily sacrificial meat. Or maybe some people explain Chugu Chag is to make a circle, like Choni Amagel, Ag Uga, and then Chag Chuga is the same as Ag Uga. You made a circle, a Chug, like a, a, a circle of dancing. Maybe you're supposed to dance and celebrate, and it's celebratory. Uh, it's time to make a celebration, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's time to sacrifice. So now we're going to have a whole question. So basically our question was, doesn't say it in the Torah, which we said, no, no, no. Torah doesn't necessarily mean sacrifice of Chagiga. Maybe it means celebration. So now we're going to have a whole question. Really? Chag could be celebration? Don't we see it in other places that Chag means sacrifices? So we're going to go through different parts of the Torah where it has the language of Chag. When it says... Moshe, chapter five of Shemot, says to Paro, I want to leave, I want you to let us go out of Egypt for a few days so we can go celebrate to our God. What did he mean? What you think that means? Have a celebration? No, what he meant was we want to sacrifice to our God. If you say maybe he really just meant we want to have a party outside, you know, in the desert. Haktiv, doesn't it say? By Yomer Moshe in chapter 10, this is after Makat Choshech or when the Choshech is going on. I forget exactly where it comes up, but around there. Uh, the plague of darkness it says, Not only do we want to go, but you're going to bring us animals to sacrifice. So here it seems clear that Yahoguli Bamidbar is to bring sacrifices. That was mentioned in chapter five, right? Here he's describing what he wants to do. So they say, No, maybe he meant to say, We want animals because he even says, I want to go celebrate to God, but eating meat, not necessarily sacrifices. When he says, even though normally that doesn't mean sacrifices, maybe here it just means eat meat. No, it, uh, again, we're going to bring a different verse now. To say, no, chag really means sacrifice. How so? We're going to bring a different verse also from Vayikra 23. No, sorry. This is from Shmot 23. Sorry about that. This is from Shmot in Sefer Mishpatim, uh, Parsha Mishpatim. It says, you can't leave the forbidden fats of my chagi, which we'll explain what chagi is in a minute, um, until the morning, which basically means the fats of the sacrifices. So now you see chag is clearly sacrifices. The fats of the sacrifices have to be burnt by the morning. This was something that went on with all sacrifices. You always had to burn the fats by the morning. And here it's talking specifically on chag on the holiday. It says, don't leave the chalev of my sacrifices from the holiday till the morning. So there you see Chag is sacrifices. 
if you think it's a celebration, what are there fats of celebrations? No, if I just have meat, because for the, you know, for the celebrate laboratory thing of having meat and I don't sacrifice it on the altar, uh, there's no fats that I burn on the altar. So it doesn't make sense. So then they say, well, maybe it means, maybe it is talking about the chalab of the sacrifices, but maybe the word chag doesn't mean sacrifice. Maybe chag means holiday. And what it means is, chalab haba bizman chag lo yalin. The fats that come when there's a chag, when there's a holiday, don't leave over till the morning. Okay, that sounds like a good explanation. And then chag could still mean like where Papa tried to say chag is celebration, in which case we're back to square one, which is, which is explaining really chagiga isn't written in the Torah. To which the Gemara says, wait, that doesn't make any sense though. So you're trying to say then, sounds like the verse is saying, any sacrifice you do on the holiday, don't leave till the morning. Which seems to imply what? If it's sacrifice that had kola shana kula, yalim. If it's a sacrifice that's during the regular year, that's not a holiday sacrifice, you can leave it over past the morning. But we know you can't do that. Because as I said before, all sacrifices can't be left till the morning. They all have to be burnt overnight, as it says in a different verse, kola laila ada bokirktif. It burns all night until the morning. That's it. Can't have it burn after that. So they say, well, notice that verse is worded in the positive. In our verse, lo yalin is worded in the negative. So maybe, dilma ima hu, if you just had that verse, hava mina hula ase. That's just to tell you there's a positive commandment to burn it by the morning. But, this is to teach you there's also a negative commandment about leaving it over. And that's why we need the two verses. And still, it could mean kag is holiday. To which they say, what do you mean? There is already a different pastor telling us that it's a negative commandment by all of them, in which case we wouldn't want to separate holiday chalavim different from any others because it already says a lot there. This is a verse in chapter uh, 16 of Sefer Dvarim, which says you can't leave from the meat of your sacrifices until the morning. In other words, the, the fats of the sacrifices. So you can't, leave it till the morning. And it says, no, you can't. And also says it in the positive. So why would we have this negative commandment when we already have a negative commandment specifically by holidays? To which they say, maybe it's to say specifically on the holiday, there's two low tasses and one asa. That would basically mean you would get lashes, two sets of lashes. Maybe that's what they're saying. There's a special thing on the holidays other than anything else. In which case, we do have a possibility, as Rakhista said, that maybe that, uh, as Rapapa said, that maybe Chalev is really not, maybe Chag is really not mentioned in the Torah at all. But now they say, Ella, Atya, Midbar, Midbar. Wait, so then, um, according to this one second, according to this, we get to. Um, Right, so we're basically stuck with Rav Papa's question, which is, sorry, when the Gemara said, it's Mikhtav Ktivan, they said, how do you know the Chag is really, in other words, we're still, it's really an answer to the question, but it's really in Rav Papa's question, which is, how do you know the Chag means Korban Chagiga, maybe it means something else. So now we're going to bring a different proof. But uh, midbar midbar. Really, we learn it from Xerah Shava, that Chag really means Korban Chagiga. How do we know? Because it says we're going to celebrate in the desert. That was the Pasuk by Moshe. And it says in a different place, in Amos, in the Nevi'im, it says, did you bring me Zvachim and Mincha, which are sacrifices in the desert? So Malahalan Zvachim, just like there it says desert. And by us it says desert. Since there it says desert, and here it says desert, and there it was sacrifices, here it's also sacrifices. And that's how we know that it's that way. So now they say, Umay karina tlim basara. Well, then this isn't karina tlim basara. This is exerashava. This is one of the regular ways we learn things. This is not like hanging by a string. This is hanging by something significant. So they answered, Yabre Torah, Yabre Kabbalah, Yofim. No. Generally, exerashavas are for Torah from Torah, not Torah from Nivim. So this was learned out from the prophets. That's why it's hanging by a, th- by a thread or by a hair. Okay. And that's how, that's our eventual connection. The Korbanot Chagiga are not mentioned explicitly in the Torah. They're only really learned out from Zerah Shava that teaches us that the root Chag means sacrifice. And then we apply that to Vayikra Kav Gimel, where it talks about bringing sacrifices on the holiday. Okay, our last topic for today, Me'ilo. How do we know the Me'ilo? What is Me'ilo? Me'ilo means misuse of consecrated property by accident. 
Okay, it's accidental misuse. I didn't know something was consecrated. I put money aside at some point, it was consecrated money. Then let's say I sanctified something to the temple and then I redeemed it the money and I put it aside and I forgot. It doesn't have to be money necessarily, it could be anything. I forgot that I did that. I now use it to go buy milk in the store. So at that point, what happens? I'm li liable for me. So let's say it was, you know, $5. Okay, and I gave an example of something that didn't cost very much. I'd have to give $5 to the temple plus a quarter, a fifth, it's called a homesh, which is really a quarter the way they come to it. I'm not gonna get into that now. We'll see that in another video. But I add a quarter more, that's my penalty. I pay an addition. Then I have to also bring a korban asham ni'ilo, okay? A special korban guilt offering. Only if I did it accidentally, okay? So mi'ilot, mi'chtav tivam. What do you mean? Laws of mi'ila are said explicitly in the Torah. Where do you think we got the sacrifices and the karen and the chomesh, which is the value of the item in the fifth? It's all said in the Torah. So what do you mean? So they say, Amar Rabbi Barachama, lo mitzcha el el chiditna. Just like by Shabbat, we came up with a unique circumstance here also. We come up with a unique circumstance. It says in the Mishnah, hashaliach sh'asa shlichuto. Let's say I, I didn't go buy the milk myself. I sent you to go buy milk. And you bought milk. If you did exactly what I asked you, and you use my money, and neither of us knew it was hektesh, I'm responsible because I sent you. The, if though, but if you didn't do what I sent you to do, and you decided instead of buying milk, you were going to buy eggs, you bought eggs instead. It's your responsibility. You're, you're responsible. Okay, Neither of us knew it was hektesh, but it's a matter of whether you did what I said or you didn't do what I said. Now they claim, now, in the end, Who's the one who spent the money? The shaliach. It's true you're spending my money, but he did it, not me. We have this concept in general. If I tell you, go up to the top of a tall building and jump off and you do it, right? Who's responsible? You or me. You're supposed to have your own mind. Now, it's true in this case. It's not really an issue of your mind because nobody really knew, but still, you're the one who did it, not me. So you should be responsible. So that's, that's, not exactly what we would normally think. And that's why it's not based in Torah law. To which the Gemara says, I'm a level, my kushia. What are you talking about? That's not a difficulty. This isn't a strange thing. By truma, it says, you shouldn't get a sin by misusing the by truma. I don't remember the context exactly, but the word appears there by truma. Mahatam. Now, the whole laws of Adam Kamoto, which means if I send you to do something for me, you can be my messenger, and you're basically like me. You're an extension of myself. Since we learned it by Truma, because it says in the Psukim that you should, also you, also you means, it teaches you, that you can take Truma from me. If you take the, the you pick my fruits, and then you take the Truma and give it to the coin, that's as if I did it. So likewise, if you buy my milk, it's as if I did it. That we learn out from Truma, Xerah Shava, Me'ila to Truma. This is clearly in the Torah because it's Xerah Shava. So therefore, just like we say there, Mahatam Shluchoshel Adam Kamoto, a messenger like a, is just like a person himself or herself, Avkan Shluchoshel Adam Kamoto, you're basically my messenger, but you're doing it for me. So that's why I get, I'm responsible. So now they say, Alam Rabba. So Rabba brings, because he rejects this, he brings his own answer. He now says, um, We need it for the following. Let's say I sent you to buy milk and I didn't know it was me'ila money, right? Uh, sanctified money. But once I sent you on your way and you got to the store, I realized, oh no, this is hektish money. But I couldn't reach you. Either you weren't looking at your phone or we were living in a time where there were no phones and ways of communicating. I couldn't get to you in time. And I really don't want you to buy it now because it's, I know it's sanctified money. So if that's the case, niskar balabayit, below niskar shaliach, but the shaliach didn't figure that out before the shaliach bought the milk, shaliach ma'al. So it's now the shaliach's responsibility because I basically canceled the shlichut, even though you didn't know, but I didn't want you going. So it's your responsibility at that point. So shaliach anya, my kavid, right? This poor shaliach, what? Wasn't his fault, right? Why are you making him responsible? So hainu kavarim atli masara. That's exactly what we mean, that it's really not, Logical by Torah law, but it's a unique halacha here. To which Ravashi rejects. Amo el amo Ravashi. No, lo nitzcha ela. I'm sorry, I think I skipped. Amo Ravashi, my kusha. Why is that difficult? Dilma midi havi amotzi hekdesh lechulin. This is no different from. There's a lot of strange laws about meila that are in the Torah. For example, if I buy milk myself, 
what happens? Since I now am liable to return that money to the temple, the money that was sanctified is no longer sanctified. It becomes chulin. So therefore, this is no different, basically, than that situation. This is like if I, just like the, the store owner now takes the money and can buy whatever they want with it, and it's totally fine. Likewise, it's not the same thing exactly, but it's this concept of once it's only shogeg and it's only someone who actually spends the money. And therefore, in this case, I didn't really want you doing it. You did it. You were the one who spent the money. Just like the money goes, becomes chulin after I do it. Likewise, the shalach can be responsible. So Ravashi doesn't think that that's so strange. Therefore, Elam Ravashi, lo nitzcha el He needs it for the following case. Peers in the Mishnah, natal evan o korash el hektish, reze lo ma'al. If I have a stone or a beam that's hektish in my, in my property, let's say, or I don't know, I found it on the street, let's say, and I pick it up. Okay, we'll see later where it is. But right now, it doesn't, we don't know where it is. I just pick it up. By picking it up, I didn't do me'ila because I didn't use it for anything. But nitzanal chavero, as soon as I pass it to somebody else, hu ma'al v'chavero lo ma'al. I am liable from me'ila by just handing it to him that he's not responsible. Okay, because then what happens? I gave it to him. It becomes hulin, like we said a minute ago, becomes unsanctified and he could do with it whatever he wants. So now, michti mishka shakla, just right. When I pick it up or I give it to someone, right? Once I give it to him, mali hu, mali chavero. Hainu, What's the difference whether I lift it or I give it to someone? It's all the same. What's the difference? Why in one case do we say that's not meila? In the second case, we say it is meila. It doesn't make any sense. But we're going to have a rejection. We'll only see this tomorrow. Maybe it's like Shmuel says this again isn't so strange. Dama Shmuel, we'll see tomorrow what the case was and why it's not so strange. And then we'll try to figure out what exactly is strange about Me'ila that doesn't really indicate such in the Torah. We'll end with this for today. Have a Shabbat Shalom. Wish Shabbat Shalom, everybody.